Today it's my <clears throat> uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, our uh, speaker, Payman, Dr. Payman Jafari, who is a uh, uh, associate research, research scholar at uh, our center here. Uh, uh, Dr. Jafari arrived uh, uh, last semester. Uh, he uh, is a graduate of uh, <clears throat> Leiden University in history, I have a PhD in history, and, uh, and uh, often when we talk to our students who have just finished their dissertation, we tell them that, you know, you need to expand your dissertation a little bit into a book manuscript. This is uh, Paymon's uh, dissertation, uh, and uh, if some of you are thinking about a morning exercise, I would invite you to just carry this book with you, see how heavy it is. Uh, and uh, we are trying to do the opposite for Paymon to, to find a way to shrink this uh, dissertation into a book manuscript. But what wonderful, wonderful study of, uh, of uh, oil workers in Iran and uh, some of which you're going to hear about uh, today. Uh, uh, Dr. Jafari is a prolific writer and, um, and also a uh, public speaker. Uh, on uh, questions of politics and modern history of Iran. Uh, he's rather a well-known uh, commentator in, in the Netherlands, uh, and, uh, and we are very fortunate to have him here with us. Um, he has published uh, uh, numerous uh, uh, book chapters and articles and has edited, co-edited a volume, uh, which I also highly recommend, Iran in the Middle East, Transnational Encounters, uh, and uh, social history co-edited with Hushan Shahabi, who is going to be visiting us in March, I believe, um, and Maral Jefrudi. Um, and uh, he's been a visiting scholar at SOAS, at uh, NYU, Columbia. Uh, I'm sorry, Columbia, not NYU. And, uh, and uh, here he is. He's going to talk for 45 to 50 minutes, and then we'll have uh, plenty of time for your comments and questions. Thank you, and let's welcome Paymon Jeff. Well, thanks for coming here, and uh, Berus, thanks for your kind introduction, and also for giving me the opportunity to present my work today here, and also Becky Pernion, thanks for facilitating the meeting and helping with the beautiful design of the poster. Um, so, as you see on the slide behind me, I'm going to talk about oil, labor, and the making of the Iranian Revolution. And uh, seeing the dots, you might think I have spilled some oil on the slides. That's unfortunately not the case. I'm one of those poor fellows who study oil, doesn't own much of it. Um, but uh, luckily for me, I get the time to talk to you and uh, exchange some ideas on this, on this topic. Um, so, as Meris uh, um, was also explaining, this uh, talk comes is based on my research done for my dissertation, uh, and I will. I'm also very grateful for having the time uh, at Princeton University at the Iran Center to actually shrink that <laughs> uh, book into uh, a dissertation into a book uh, a project. Um, I position my own work uh, at the intersection of three historiographic. Uh, fields um, uh, being uh, uh, concerned with oil, the Pahlavi era, and the Iranian uh, revolution. But to give you the broader context of my research and the approach that informs it, I want to start by addressing the following two questions. Why study oil in the first place? And then if we study oil, uh, how to study oil? How should it be studied? When you look at any uh, era, you will discern uh, certain commodities that really define those ages, those, those eras. So when you look, for instance, to the 18th century, um, that was the era of sugar and sugar plantations. Sugar consumption in Britain rose fivefold between 1710 and 1770, and by 1750, it had surpassed grain as the most valuable commodity in European trade. The French Enlightenment writer Guillaume Thomas de Renal even called sugar the principal cause of the rapid movement which stirs the universe. During the 19th century, cotton production was central to the Industrial Revolution as it developed around textile manufacturing, and in turn, cotton production heavily depended on war making, uh, colonial expansion, 
exploitation, and enslaved labor. As Jürgen Osterhammel has argued, the 19th century was also the century of coal, of course. The rise of coal marked the transition from above ground sources of energy, being humans, uh, plants, animals, wind and water, to subterranean sources of energy. Coal fueled the steam engines that enabled the massive expansion of transport and industry. By the time that coal had reached its zenith as a source of energy in the second decade of the 20th century, it was being replaced by another fossil fuel, oil. After the first commercial oil well was dug in 1859 in Pennsylvania, oil production took off in the following decades in the US, in Mexico, in Baku, Venezuela, and later on in the Middle East. The First World War was a turning point as the British Navy switched from coal to oil, enabling its ships to run faster. Oil became an increasingly important source of energy in industry, transport, and private consumption. The development of refinery and petrochemical technology led to a fundamental transformation of the everyday lives of millions of people as petrol-driven automobiles increased mobility and petroleum products such as lubricants, nylon, and plastic helped to create hundreds of new consumer products. Oil became also a fundamental component of domestic and international politics. Hence, calling the 20th century the century of oil will not surprise anyone, I think. But how is oil then studied? Just as crude oil can be distilled and cracked through chemical and ke uh, chemical processes into dozens of products in refineries, its history has been processed into various narratives as well. Some histories of oil have been told from the vantage point of the venture capitalists, mainly European and American men, who searched the bowels of the earth for black gold from the mid 19th century to early 20th century. These were the oil men, so vividly depicted in Upton Sinclair's classic novel, Oil, on which the movie There Will Be Blood is based as well. William Knox Dorsey, here on the right, um, was one of these men. Born in England, he funded the search for oil in Iran in 1900, winning a concession from the Qajar king to exploit it for 60 years. And luckily for him, his expedition found oil in southern Iran in 1908, just as he was facing uh, bankruptcy. This discovery marked the beginning of the Anglo-Persian uh, uh, oil company, to which I will refer as APOC in the rest of the story, uh, that was later renamed uh, British, oil, uh, British Petroleum. So another historical narrative uh, that developed was around these kind of large multinational companies as BP, the Royal Dutch Shell, uh, etc. Yet another corpus of publications has emphasized the role of oil as a source of rent. Since the Iranian economist Hossein Mahdavi coined the concept rentier state in 1970, hundreds of books and articles have been published on the oil curse. Oil supposed capacity to create dictatorships, uh, economic stagnation, and civil wars. Despite their differences, all these genres have one thing in common. They all write labor out of the history of oil production, transportation, and consumption. This stems from a reified conceptualization of oil, or as Marx would call it, commodity fetishism par excellence, as it obscures the social relations of production which, in which oil is embedded. And hence, oil appears to us as a magical thing. This is quite well reflected in a passage that Richard Kopuczynski wrote in Under 1970s Iran. Oil creates the illusion of a completely changed life, life without work, life for free. The concept of oil expresses perfectly the eternal human dream of wealth or achieved through lucky accident. In this sense, oil is a fairy tale, and like every fairy tale, a bit of a lie. Writing the history of oil differently means, therefore, to demystify and to derify it by looking at how labor shapes the social relations, politics, cultures, that are formed as oil flows from the wells into pipelines arriving in refineries and petrochemical complexes, following its route into tankers, ports, distribution centers, and gas stations. This new way of thinking about oil has produced a new research program around the idea of energy humanities, to which I also hope to uh, contribute. 
much of the energy humanities uh, literature at the moment is really based on the cultural aspect, consumption culture uh, aspect of oil, which I also will try to do in my uh, forthcoming book as well. But today, I want to take more the social approach, the social history approach to it by focusing on the role of labor and more in particular labor activism as it shaped uh, uh, defining moments in Iranian history, particularly the Iranian uh, uh, revolution. So there have been uh, three moments um, in uh, modern Iranian history uh, in which oil activism, oil workers activism has played a, a defining role. Uh, these were in 1929, 1946, and nine, uh, 1978, the Iranian Revolution. And I had promised myself to not talk too much about 1929 and 1946, so I have time for the Iranian Revolution. But being a historian, I can't really uh, leave that out. So I will try to be brief on those uh, moments. Um, 1929 is important because that was really the first moment uh, of such a general strike in the oil industry in southwest uh, Iran, in Abadan, in the, in the refinery. And why was this important? Um, uh, because first of all, it uh, uh, reflected the emergence of popular politics in Iran. Uh, Stephanie Cronin has written a beautiful article on this, the emergence of the mass strike, uh, and also the agency of this industrial working class. But I think it was also important in two other aspects. Namely, that uh, this was a time of uh, state formation in Iran uh, under Reza Shah, uh, authoritarian modernization. But this oil strike, in fact, very much influenced that process of state formation and how the state was defining its relationship with the forces above it, the international uh, forces, but also the forces below it, this, uh, the, the society, the societal forces. So in terms of the international component, um, uh, Reza Shah was trying to uh, renegotiate the Darcy concession, to which I already referred in 1928. Um, he had uh, his uh, minister of court, uh, Taymur Tash, do the uh, uh, renegotiations. And often in the history of the oil strike, the um, social demands of the workers are talked about. And this is um, uh, 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 given the condition of the workers at that time, it was miserable, uh, wages were low, Housing was very bad in cities like, uh, like Abadan. So the workers did indeed have much of those uh, social economic demands. But they were also rising, in fact, the demand against the British oil company uh, and the managers and calling for the renegotiation of the Darcy concession. So the demand was not only coming from the state elites, but it was also really coming from uh, uh, workers themselves and particularly, of course, the more... Uh, um, militant uh, activists among them, inspired by the Bolshevik Revolution in, in Russia, uh, uh, etc. Um, so it played an important role in that aspect, but it also defined the state-society relations because it's, it really put on the agenda the social question in Iran. Because the Shah was modernizing uh, 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 Iran, but I mean, creating a new modern industry, but how do you integrate this modern working class and how do you discipline them? In order to do that, you will also need regulations, laws, and so on. So the um, oil strike really gave an impetus to put the social question on the agenda and start thinking about regulations and laws. So for instance, eight months after the end of the oil strike, when Reza Shah went to Abadan, his uh, minister, Taymur Tash, actually tried to get a concession from the oil company of 5% wage increase to actually show to the workers and the, and the uh, emerging working class that the uh, new system was also trying to accommodate them in order to prevent such uh, strikes in the, in the future. And this dynamic was also visible in the uh, mass strike of 1946 in, in Abadan, uh, which also, during which also the demand of oil nationalization, again, was not only called on by uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh, who was leading the oil nationalization movement, but also was really uh, called on uh, by um, oil workers themselves. In fact, this is also interesting to know, the participation of women in both of the strikes of 1929 and 1946 
was remarkable. And one of the women during this demonstration was calling in 1946 already for the nationalization of the, uh, of the oil industry, which was nationalized in 1951. And the strikes uh, continued into uh, 1953 as well. So, and this was also the moment of the really uh, birth of resource nationalism. Again, not only as an elite discourse, but also something that was driven by the forces within, uh, within society. Now coming to uh, the revolution and the role of the, uh, of the oil workers, um, let me first give you an overview of the revolutionary process. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the story, so I won't go into details, but just to give you the overview, um, and I'm here actually following Dr. Ashraf's uh, uh, um, periodization of the uh, uh, revolution, in which uh, uh, the demonstrations, petitions, uh, the demands start in 1977, driven mainly by lawyers, doctors, uh, students, uh, writers, uh, who write petitions uh, demanding civil uh, liberties. Um, but the demonstrations really start from January 1978 uh, in uh, cycles of 40 days, uh, because with every demonstration, dozens of people were uh, shot and then killed. And according to Shia uh, uh, tradition, they were commemorated 40 days later, and the same would happen. So you had this cycle of 40 days uh, demonstrations well into the summer of 1978. But then after the summer, something very different starts. Uh, mainly industrial action strikes in uh, uh, industrial centers of Iran, mainly also, of course, in the oil industry. And that continues until uh, uh, February 1979. Uh, that's the period uh, that you could call as the situation of dual power, because uh, parallel to the existing state, um, institutions emerge that are challenging that sovereignty of the existing state like the Islamic Neighborhood uh, Committees, the Coordination Committees, uh, and I will return to this, that is created to coordinate the all strikes, the Secret Council of the Islamic Revolution, uh, that is led by Ayatollah Khomeini, who returns to Iran on 1st of uh, February. But the all strikes uh, themselves um, uh, went also through, uh, I distinguish at least four distinctive uh, faces of the uh, of the oil strikes, and given the importance of the oil strikes during the revolution, it is in fact surprising that no serious historical account has been yet written on the uh, development of these uh, of these strikes. By going through Sabak reports, newspapers, and interviews with oil workers, I have tried to reconstruct the day-to-day -day development of the oil strikes in some detail but I will limit myself here to the main uh, landmarks. So the first strikes started on 8th of September in Tehran refinery and spread to the oil fields of southern Iran. This prompted the Sabak, the Shah's uh, secret police, to report that the oil strikes have no precedent in recent years. The strikes must have developed among workers in the National Oil Company very quickly." End of quote. In an addendum to the report, Sabak registered 21 strikes in the oil industry in the 10 days between 17 and 26 September, um, involving 11,000 oil workers. And according to a US embassy report, the blue collar workers in Khuzestan presented a list of 48 demands topped with a 50% wage increase. Indeed, the strikes had a largely spontaneous character, which also meant that by early October, the oil strikes had subsided after officials made some concessions. But a second wave started when oil workers in Abadan staged a sit-in on 16th of October. Two days later, the white-collar workers in the oil company offices of Ahwaz joined them, starting a strike that lasted for 33 days. At about the same time, the blue-collar workers in the oil fields near Ahwaz went on strike as well. These strikes faded in the last two weeks of November, but in the meantime, oil workers had become better organized. The oil strikes, like any other class-based uh, protest, involved an uneven and complex process of social mobilization in which demands were articulated differently depending on the position of the workers in the labor process, their uh, traditions of activism, uh, and the culture in their cities, uh, uh, and so on. 
All workers' propensity to strike differed, of course, but the resulting tensions were usually overcome by persuasion or social uh, pressure, as always happens in these kind of uh, general strikes. So let me give you two examples of these uh, different kind of pressures. One, which also uh, exemplifies this issue of how um, the different mentalities uh, uh, are created depending on people's position in the labor process, for instance. Because in the Abaddon uh, refinery, the most militant workers were based in the central workshop. Uh, they were also the older workers, had lots of uh, 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 experience uh, working in there, but this was also a huge workshop bringing together several hundred of workers who day to day worked together and went through this long uh, uh, experiences. So they were very uh, 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 willing to take action. On the other uh, extreme of the spectrum, you had the process workers who worked in night shifts in the uh, 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 process rooms that con the control uh, rooms of the, of the of the refinery. There you had three, four, or at most five workers uh, uh, coming together. So they were much more hesitant in joining the revolution because they were also much more vulnerable. Uh, you know, the managers could immediately see who those workers were. But also their work, them going on strike meant uh, an irreversible uh, uh, consequence, namely the shutdown of the whole refinery because the whole process, the chemical processes would come to a, to a standstill. Um, so first, there was lots of pressure on these workers to, to join them. In an interview, one of the Tehran workers gave me an anecdote of them sending a headscarf to these workers from Tehran, uh, basically laughing at them like you're acting like women, and we rightly would consider that as very sexist nowadays, but that was their way of uh, telling them, join the uh, revolution, why are you uh, being so soft? Uh, but also, there were examples of more uh, violent pressure. So when these workers were not joining at the end of uh, December, January, uh, other workers would actually uh, gather in front of the buses that would take them from their houses to the refinery to protest them, to call them to join uh, the revolution. But overall, uh, there would be these processes of negotiations and slowdowns and, 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 and strikes. I have only seen a few examples of real violence actions that didn't actually come from the old workers themselves, but from uh, Islamist activists that were trying to uh, target the managers of the of the oil industry. So on 23rd December, three gunmen of the Islamist guerrilla group Mujahideen ambushed and killed ba Paul Brim, the American general director of the oil company in Ahvaz, who had replaced George Link after his car was bombed in November. On the same day, an Iranian oil official, uh, Malik Burujerdi, the father of uh, Professor Rajudi was killed in Ahwaz uh, as well. So, but again, these were on the margins of the of the of the old strike. Most important were the attempts to organize and expand the organizations of the uh, on which the uh, strikes uh, were were built. At Abadan Refinery, the blue collar workers formed a thirteen member strike committee in late October. They were in contact with the strike committee of the white collar workers in Ahwaz, the association of the oil industry staff employees, that consisted of 60 representatives elected from different departments of the, of the company. A founding member explained the process as following. The representatives were not elected by secret ballot. The vote took place in front of everyone. We put up a list on the wall. People came and signed their names next to the name of their preferred candidate. There were usually five or six candidates per position. The first duty of these representatives was to organize the association of professional and office workers. So we called this body the Organizing Committee of Oil Industry Employees. The association was further formalized in the last week of November with the election of a coordination committee. In Tehran Refinery, a secret strike committee of blue-collar workers had been active since September, but a new committee including white-collar workers was established in the second week of November. Its 12 representatives were selected from the various refinery departments. In later November, the common syndicate and the employees of the 
Iranian oil industry was established to represent for the first time both the blue collar workers and the white collar uh, workers. In a uh, common syndicate of the employees of the Iranian oil industry. By late October, oil workers were demanding, among other things, an end to the martial law, the release of, oil, um, of all political prisoners, Iranianization of the oil industry, and an end to discrimination against female employees and the dissolution of Savak. The composition of the strike committees differed from place to place, but often the leading members belonged to or sympathized with the organizations of the secular left including the Fadayan and, to lesser degree, the Tuda Party, or the Islamic, Islamist leftist uh, People's Mujahideen. Others were followers of Ayatollah Khomeini or independents. It is notable, however, that when the strikes erupted, the presence of the organized left was very weak among the oil workers, as state repression had diminished the space for political activity in the oil industry, but this was also exacerbated by the uh, guerrilla strategy of the uh, main organizations of the left that made it very difficult to kind of organize uh, more openly. During the strikes, however, the left recruited new members and increased its influence. In Ahwaz, 35% of the delegates of the strike committee that all workers had elected in November self-identified as Marxists. But after the fall of the monarchy, the supporters of Ayatollah Khomeini in coalition with liberal Islamic figures like Mehdi Bazargan, who headed the provisional government, maneuvered to marginalize the left and organize new elections, in which the left gained 15%. It is worth noting that religiously uh, inspired worker militants were active as well. And I'm emphasizing because there are basically two parallel histories of, 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 the, of the Iranian revolution. One given by you know, the official uh, historians of the Islamic Republic that only emphasize the leading role of Ayatollah uh, Khomeini, and then you have often the leftist uh, histories that only emphasize the role of uh, of the leftist organizations. But in my, from my view, they both were really active in 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 the uh, uh, strikes uh, as well. It is worth noting that um, religiously inspired worker militants were active as well, and that at this stage ideological differences and party lines were not sharply defined. Moreover, among the religious workers, many identified with the class politics advocated by lay intellectuals like Ali Shariati. One could find a plethora of both Islamist and socialist discourses among the oil workers that were often indistinguishable. Interviewing Abadan oil workers, one journalist observed, most of the oil workers are devout, practicing Muslims, but of the anti-clerical kind that believe that a religious movement, which began with the uncompromising demand for the removal of the Shah, will not end until, the re until religion itself undergoes radical change. We give Khomeini due respect for so stubbornly refusing to compromise with the Shah, said a oil maker in Abadan refinery. But after all, Dr. Shariati wrote this revolution, Khomeini only led it. We are not going to be slaves to these machines, says a young welder. In an Islamic Republic, the community and not consumption is the goal. This gives you an impression of the different mentalities and discourses uh, present at the time. Having established a stronger organizational structure, the oil workers resumed their strikes in early December, initiating the third phase, oh, I should have done this, the third phase um, of, the, of these strikes. Following Khomeini's call for a general strike on 2nd uh, of December to coincide with the beginning of the holy month of Muharram, the common syndicate issued a call for a general strike in the oil industry. The Abadan refinery took the lead once again, but the strike spread to the offshore oil platforms and the Ahwas and Maroon oil fields in the following days. In Gach Saron and Al-Bajari, workers were forced to work at Bayonet Point, but they went on strike at the end of the second week of December. The government's increased repression in December backfired, as over 6,000 oil workers uh, quit their jobs when officials threatened to dismiss uh, the strikers. The fourth and the final phase uh, of the oil strikes that started in the last days of 1978 wasn't marked by an interlude, but more by a qualitative uh, change. And that's what I already explained, the emergence of dual power situation uh, uh, based on these different uh, institutions. 
Um, the strike committees of the oil workers had taken control of oil production at the local level by that time. But more importantly, they were essential in the creation of dual power as the oil strikes functioned as the launching pad for the three main institutions that emerged parallel to the existing state. First of all, um, the, the first organization was the organization that was established by Ayatollah Khomeini to coordinate the oil strikes. And that was led by uh, Bazargan, here arriving in uh, Abadan, uh, uh, accompanied by uh, Raf Sanjani, who was also in this uh, uh, oil coordination committee. And by the way, if you listen to the names, these are all big figures in the Iranian revolution and gives you a sense of the importance of this, uh, of this, of this committee. Because also as uh, um, Bazargan explained in his interviews and memoirs, uh, he was particularly important in convincing Ayatollah Khomeini in the creation of this uh, organ, because he realized that taking control over the oil strikes would give authority to uh, uh, the whole revolutionary leadership ar around uh, Khomeini, uh, sorry, uh, yes, uh, Khomeini. And um, uh, that happened as well because in the first weeks of January, the um, uh, Islamic uh, Revolution Council was established, building on a previously existing committee, but the oil strikes really gave it uh, that kind of uh, authority. And the third, but not last important uh, organ of uh, dual power were the neighborhood committees uh, that were established uh, in, uh, in dozens of, of, of cities. And these were created basically based on the necessity to distribute fuel uh, that was caused because of the shortages of the, of the strikes and it was winter, don't forget, in, in January in, in Iran. So you had young people uh, bringing basically fuel to different houses uh, or queuing and uh, new forms of solidarity and, 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 and stories would emerge in these gatherings as people waited for uh, oil distribution. But these oil distribution activities were central in bringing the youth together, sometimes around mosques, sometimes not, to uh, organize the uh, uh, neighborhood committees that were uh, established uh, later. So this is one of the main arguments I make in my book to demonstrate how the struggle over the control over the oil strikes revealed the very uh, political nature of the revolution, also in terms of the relationship that Ayatollah Khomeini established with the mass movement as a, as a whole. So we have seen that the oil strikes were important, but why did oil workers participate in them? That's another question that I want to uh, put on the table here. Um, in order to answer that question, let me, this work, by the way, the uh, oil distribution uh, uh, centers of the oil industry. To answer that question, I want to give you three dominant representations of oil workers uh, uh, in Iran. One representation of oil workers is that is familiar. Um, is, I think, uh, conveyed in this painting by Nas uh, Nusratullah Muslimian uh, from 1978. Uh, you see um, in the corner, all workers are depicted in their uh, workplace. Very harsh job under the ground. It's, you know, it's just like, uh, reminds you of Emil Zola's kind of uh, working in the coal industry. And I think that's, that's really the uh, inspiration and the message that he's trying to convey. And in the very right corner, um, that's the community level. You see the wives of the old workers uh, mourning for the, uh, for the victims uh, and having a miserable life uh, in their community as well. And in the center, of course, you see the workers marching under the red banner uh, to their uh, liberation. Well, I bring this up because this is obviously one narrative uh, about the old workers which going back to the 1929 strike and 1946 strike sees as very dominant this leftist um, discourse and tradition among oil workers. But I really think that it forgets how the oil worker uh, uh, communities uh, and, and, and them as a class were basically reformed during the 1960s and 1970s 
new ideologies, new ways of life coming into uh, the industry. So I think this is too crude and simplistic. The other narrative that is, of course, very much conveyed by the uh, Islamic leaders of the Iranian revolution is that the workers were just pious people who would follow Ayatollah Khomeini into uh, the, the, the revolution. Um, so also there, not a surprise, uh, they were pious, why wouldn't they participate uh, the revolution? Um, and then the third narrative that was conveyed by uh, the monarchy and the managers of the uh, oil industry and their supporters is that, well, the oil workers were leading a very happy life. Uh, the oil industry were, was taking care for them in their work, in their communities. Uh, they could go to the pool, there were shops for them, etc. So the fact that they joined uh, the revolution must have been the work of uh, manipulative agitators that then uh, fooled them to join the revolution. And I think you can't tell this story about all kind of revolutions of, you know, this, this, this kind of uh, uh, narratives. And I mean, there is always a kernel of uh, truth in uh, each of them, but um, uh, together I don't think they give you uh, uh, a picture of the complex reality of the all workers' life. So, the, um, socioeconomically, all workers were relatively better off than some others. Uh, but they did have grievances that resonated with demands of the revolutionary movement at large. Most importantly, they were not homogeneous. There would, there would be huge wage differences between unskilled workers, skilled workers, the white collar workers, and definitely the managers who would earn four to five times more than an, uh, unskilled workers. Uh, another uh, huge difference was between those uh, who were working for the oil company and who were working as subcontractors. Um, and you can see that in, the, in this line, uh, you see a rise of the number of subcontractors well into the 1970s. And of course, after the revolution, that increases more. And with more of the um, trends under the Islamic Republic, we see that there is also some continuity with what was happening before, uh, uh, before the revolution. And that was a huge uh, grievance, because if you were not employed by the oil company, you could not benefit from, for instance, insurance or overwork, uh, etc. Um, but the main grievance of the workers was really this huge gap between, uh, to which I have already referred, the blue collar workers, which were what car gathered in Iran, and the white collar workers, the car mans. And this was institutionalized at every level of the oil industry. So they would go to different shops, they would go to different cinemas, uh, they lived in different neighborhoods of, of Abadan, and uh, the blue collar workers were not allowed to go to the neighborhoods of the white collar workers. Uh, they had different buses taking them to, to, to the work, so this created, created huge resentment, particularly among the uh, blue-collar workers. Um, and, uh, well, um, one example, I interviewed an old worker who was, another anecdote, telling me that he would always go into the toilets of the blue, uh, the white-collar workers and destroy their soaps and, and, and mirror and everything because he just resented the fact that he had to go to another uh, uh, toilet. Um, and also what I explained about the overall wages of the um, oil workers being better than other categories, don't forget that they at the same time lived in hard conditions. So working in the oil industry meant, for instance, working in uh, temperatures reaching sometimes 130 uh, degrees in Abadan or uh, Ahwas. Um, there was, by the way, another um, uh, gap that was the uh, ethnic gap in Iran, because the, you know, in southern Iran, uh, a significant part of the population are Arabs, but only 5 to 10 percent were employed in the oil industry. By the way, I couldn't find any official figures about this, because it was also, just as now, it was really treated as a sensitive and a security issue. But there was a huge overlap between what I said about the subcontractors and the Arab workers, because you see here, these are Arab workers uh, working for a subcontractor in many unskilled jobs in the, in the oil uh, industry. I also want to point out the gender aspect, uh, because you know, the oil industry was very much, and still is very much, male-dominated. 
Um, it's also very much masculine uh, kind of uh, uh, industry. You had few number of women working in the uh, administrative functions uh, of the of the oil industry, and some were uh, making it into um, uh, engineerial uh, positions uh, as well in the latter days of the of the nineteen seventies. So, two other um, grievances that I want to point out. Um, one has to do with um, this resentment against foreign domination. And, and I already explained that there was a tradition of this, going back to you know, the, the colonial era uh, under the British and later uh, American um, uh, managers uh, being very dominant in the, in the oil industry. And this was not only an ideological thing, because you know, in the 1970s, there was this huge resentment against imperialism, anti-imperialism as a discourse was very influential. But I would say that this really had also a social component because I figured out the numbers of um, uh, white collar positions that were in the hands of uh, foreigners, mainly Americans uh, and, and Europeans. And you see an increase in the 1970s. So for the Iranian white collar workers, this was seen as an obstacle for them to, you know, uh, going up the ladder of, of the hierarchy in the, in the, in the oil industry. Then um, there was also the authoritarian relationships in the, in the oil industry. And of course, this was the case in many other industries in Iran as well, because uh, free labor unions were not allowed. Uh, uh, the SAVAK was present in vetting who was uh, getting to represent workers and even being employed in uh, sensitive positions in the oil industry and so on. But I think this was particularly felt in the oil industry because there was a huge contradiction. The discourse of the oil company managers and the Shah was the oil industry is the forefront of Iranian modernization. Uh, this is the place of meritocracy. This is this is progress. And at the same time, you will feel that, you know, at the workplace level, you didn't feel much about this progress in terms of uh, political uh, uh, opening, opening up. And uh, this was even uh, uh, experienced by um, loyalist uh, workers as such, because I found a summer report on a meeting of the Rastakhis party, that was the official party under the Shah. Um, and Sabak was doing a great job, by the way, because we don't have much accounts by the workers themselves, so they would be at these meetings and, and writing this stuff up. So it quotes one of the workers and it says, today workers enjoy benefits they couldn't have dreamt of. But it is not right for the directors to decide the workers' fates behind closed doors and not to be accountable to them. So even white collar workers that were feeling the you know material progress, they also wanted to you know be part of what was uh, uh, was happening. So how long do I have? <laughs> Five minutes. Sure. So I'm not simply arguing that oil workers had pre-existing grievances that spurred them to join the revolution that would really ignore four decades of social movement and revolution studies that have highlighted how these you know, uh, processes are mediated by uh, resources, by ideologies, by political opportunities, uh, uh, and so on. Grievances are of course important, but building on William Sewell's notion of eventful temporality, I argue that it is essential to understanding how the broader revolutionary mobilization created the conditions in which the nature of those grievances themselves were transformed and the horizon of what was deemed possible changed dramatically in that process. And I think this is also important to understand the revolution and I think revolutions in general. Um, take for instance, the social gap that I already mentioned about existing between white collar workers and blue collar workers. I mean, Many blue collar workers accepted this gap uh, during the 1970s and before. But the whole revolutionary mobilization really changed the way that they were experiencing and looking to this gap because suddenly, why would they accept it? Um, there was this whole new possibility of you know, reorganizing uh, the workplace and society in different ways. I mean, realistic or not, but this, this, this was you know, the, the mentality that, that became very dominant uh, uh, through the revolutionary process uh, itself. And I think 
Um, Rosa Luxemburg has also a very interesting word about, uh, work about this relationship between politics and uh, uh, general strikes, because we often think that you know, there is a linear way between you have economic demands going into political demands, but sometimes it actually goes around and moves into the, into the workplaces. So these moments of rupture and rapid shifts, moments of madness, according to Aristotle Zolberg, are constitutive to revolutions. However, they are not mystical, and it is possible to discern the events that have such a transform transformative impact on individuals. It wasn't only the revolution that transformed the consciousness of all workers, but it was also in turn the actions of all workers that transformed the consciousness of millions of Iranians, because the oil strikes demonstrated the fatal vulnerability of the state. By early 1979, the strikes had caused a serious fuel shortage, creating an acute awareness of the gravity of the crisis that engulfed the state, because an increasing number of Iranians were directly experiencing the consequences. For instance, when queuing for, uh, for oil. Where did it go? Here. Uh, no, because uh, at the later months of 1978, uh, the uh, newspapers were, were shut down. So first of all, it was the radios that were um, uh, um, reporting on the, on the strikes because there were fuel shortages. So people knew what was happening, both the workers themselves, but also the majority of the population was really feeling the impact of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the oil strikes. And th this is, I think, very important because it pinpoints what uh, uh, Charles, Kurtzman, uh, Charles Kurtzman calls a viable uh, movement, a movement that has the perception that it can actually successfully challenge uh, the state. And I think the oil strikes were a shifting point of creating this sense of viability, not only among oil workers, but in the population uh, at, at large. Um, and I want to just round up by going back to this figure, by bringing together also why I think that the materiality of oil and social processes and cultures are so important to be understood together. Uh, in their, in their uh, 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 intertwined relationship. Um, so you see here, uh, this is the total number of oil workers. In the early 1970s, the oil industry was uh, expanding rapidly, also because the oil uh, uh, price was going up. The Shah was investing into the oil industry, building new refineries in uh, Isfahan and other places, uh, uh, building petrochemical complexes and so on. So what did this? Was actually attract thousands of new workers into the oil industry, so hence uh, the increase in the number of workers. But this had an impact because this new generation also brought with them new experiences. And I already mentioned, for instance, the uh, blue collar workers in Abadan's workshop. They were experienced, but this could cut both ways. You know, they had experience of trade union activism. But they also had the experience of the defeat of 1953 and the, and the coup d'etat and you know, the repression under the Shah. The white collar workers that were now coming in, they were often influenced by leftist ideas, by anti-imperialism, uh, student activism, and so on. And they had these uh, uh, links with, with the wider society. And together with a segment of blue collar workers, they could kind of take the lead in the oil industry in organizing them. Also, another factor that um, points to this materiality is why were the oil workers able to organize effectively? Because within the oil industry, the labor process, for instance, in the refineries was that once in a year you have to close down the whole refinery. That's called the overhaul process to uh, kind of maintain uh, the whole system. When you do this, you really need a huge number of workers that cannot be drawn from the existing pool of workers in the refinery. So you have to bring them from somewhere else. So in Tehran, they would bring them from Abadan. So also before the revolution, every year, workers would go there. What happens there? These workers would get together, talk to each other during lunchtime, and uh, have the contacts. So during the revolution, they would reach out to each other and create the, the networks. And also the educational system of the uh, oil industry contributed to this uh, 
pro process uh, enormously because the oil industry tried to recruit from the children of the oil workers. They were giving uh, uh, priority in, in, in the recruitment. So you had actually a pool of workers within their own communities that had these experiences and these social contacts and social networks. So for me, it's also important to really emphasize that understanding these kind of strikes and revolutionary processes is not only about the workplace, it is also about, you know, the social reproduction that goes on in the family, in the community and the social networks that are uh, built in that uh, process. So I want to conclude there so we will have time for some questions.